Hello, and welcome to the latest instalment of my History of Tekken series, which concerns the most recent outing by Namco, Tekken 7. Now, I've mentioned previously that the Tekken narrative has gone a bit tangent over the years, which is somewhat expected when you're dealing, you know, with a game of the fighting genre, because you basically have an ever-growing roster of characters and a limited means of exposition, and we only need to look at the 90s Jean-Claude Van Damme Street Fighter movie to see how hard it is to crowbar in 10 plus character storylines into an hour and a half of storytelling, you know, let alone a fighting focused video game, which has even less scope for this sort of narrative development. So in the very beginnings of Tekken, it offered exposition through introductory montages and character ending videos, most of which dealt with hypothetical endings for what would happen if your chosen character won the tournament. The game booklets that came packaged with each subsequent game would then make sense of this tangled web of theoretical endings by explaining to you the canonical storyline. So for example, with Tekken 2, we saw um, Heihachi return to claim back the Zaibatsu from Kazuya, because of course Kazuya, who was the, canon the canonical ending in Tekken 1, saw him defeating Heihachi to take over that Zaibatsu and, um, you know, uh, throw him off a cliff at the end of the tournament. So, as the series has progressed, we've seen, you know, these booklets and these endings expand into short vignette comic book style uh, prologues, which w were introduced in Tekken 4, and these acted as you know, prologues and introductions to every character and offered a little more context, you know, as to their storylines than, than the booklets previously had. But moving into Tekken 6, we had the quite contentiously received Azazel storyline, which ran in tandem with the even more contentiously received uh, scenario campaign mode. And it seemed at this point Namco were kind of tripping over themselves with where this story was heading and how they could best execute it and accommodate a core and cohesive narrative in these games, you know, along with this kind of growing roster of disparate and tangent characters. So we land now at Tekken 7, and I feel that Tekken 7 has wisely sought to rectify this and also propel the story forward by focusing exclusively on the Mishima blood feud, which has been this sort of um, thread running through, you know, each numerical game you know of the series and and you know each each game in the series has Mishima as the you know as the prominent story arc and character and in my opinion this works because i think an important problem for Namco has been telling a canonical story when you have any character you choose to play as being capable of winning the tournament with their and then having their hypothetical ending video so by stripping this out we have one cohesive story uh that's played out with interspersing battles um, and they and and these battles hinge around the story, rather than the story hinging around whatever character you choose to play as, which results again in this kind of hypothetical non-canon tournament. Another thing I like about Tekken Seven is there's always been a very strong sense of lineage uh, throughout the Tekken franchise, and again this has previously been accounted for in the vignette prologues and epilogues. Um, we had arcade history mode in Tekken 5 so that you could go back and you know play those earlier games. Um, and this has once again been introduced in a much more engaging way in this Tekken 7 Mishima, uh, Mishima storyline. And what I mean by this is at the beginning of the story we witness Kazuya as a child trying to defeat his father and subsequently being thrown off the cliff which is, you know, a really kind of infamous aspect of the story, but it's only previously been seen in the um, the anime, uh, Tekken the Motion Picture from 1998, which is quite dubiously received, and, yeah, you know, admittedly, it wasn't a brilliant movie, but I still think it's better than the, um, the live-action movie that they did in 2009. But um, it was really good, because we actually finally see this origin story kind of take place with Kazuya, and we also play aspects of previous Tekken games. So thinking back to the opening FMV sequence in Tekken 5, where we have Kazuya and Heihachi fighting against all these jacks that are kind of jumping in through the building. It's really cool in Tekken 7 because we actually 
participate in that. We play as Heihachi in that in that sequence, and it's where kind of Akuma is introduced and stuff. Um, but this overlapping of events from each stage of the linear story uh, ties all the threads of the Machinas together, and particularly for new players to the series, it means you don't have to spend as much time playing catch up on um, a tech and Wikipedia because you know they've thrown it in there and they've tried kind of. Um, kind of stitching it all together in quite a cohesive way, which we haven't previously seen. And at this juncture, I could probably mention the um, the journalist narrator, who, again, has been contentiously received. Um, and I didn't mind him, because I think he kind of... He allows for a, a recap and some context to take place, uh, you know, in the midst of all this action, because otherwise it would just be kind of action, cutscene with Heihachi laughing, action... And it, and it wouldn't work as well. So this kind of narrator kind of gives us an, an objective account of the events taking place, and it introduces the ideas such as the Mishima Zaibatsu and G Corp and what these respective things are. Um, so I think that worked quite well. And I think arguably, you know, you know, obviously the the, the obvious argument against this Mishima storyline is that it could have been done at the expense of choosing your character and playing through with your character. But I actually quite liked what they did here because they have small self-contained character scenarios now which are unlocked um, for each main roster member. And I think this is probably the best way they could have partitioned up the narrative elements of this game and, and you know, playing as your chosen character and getting your favourite character's ending FMV. Because again, it, it just works really well and it means that nothing's being rendered to a non-canon sort of uh, eventuality because you know generally the ending videos now uh, are taking place in in real time you know as as that given fight has taken place so i think i think it works quite well and uh again you know i think i said previously in tekken 6 that namco are always pushing the boundaries of tekken seeing what they can do with it and again this is just another development in their experimentation with how narrative and these characters can be delivered that i feel works quite well So Tekken 7 marks probably the biggest shift in pace and direction and character since Tekken 3, uh, which saw the introduction of Jin Kazama as, you know, the new blood direction of the series. So Tekken 7 introduces this journalist as an objective account of the events taking place. And he's been criticised, as I mentioned, but personally I don't mind him. And, you know, as I said, he kind of breaks up the, the pacing. But what we also see is Akuma from Street Fighter integrated into the story. And weirdly, to have a Street Fighter come in as a canonical and quite significant sort of sto uh, character in the Mishima plot, uh, I actually found that he slots in quite nicely to the Tekken universe. And I imagine he probably came quite easily uh, into the series, you know, in terms of licensing and stuff, because... Obviously, uh, over the past few years, uh, we've had Namco and Capcom crossovers, uh, most recently uh, Street Fighter Cross Tekken, and I think Tekken Cross Street Fighter is kind of grinding to a halt right now, but obviously they still have this sort of relationship going on where they can use each other's characters, which is really cool. And on that note, I mean, just noting my personal opinion of the Tekken story, the aspect of it that's always interested me has been this more esoteric, spiritual kind of aspect that deals with morality and the devil gene and the art of fighting and I feel that it has been quite diluted by the focus on G Corp and the Zaibotsu and all this business stuff and all the futuristic soldiers, you know, I'm not really down with that sort of thing uh, and along with the the goofiness and the comedy they've introduced as well to a lot of the main storyline whereas it used to be kind of on the back burner so yeah, I think the kind of aspect that Akuma is involved in is, is pretty cool, and this whole revenge tale and tragic rise and fall of Kazuya is, is what got me into this series in the first place, actually. So this is the aspect of the story that I still subscribe to, and I'm glad that it's mentioned you know, recurringly throughout this, throughout this uh, campaign mode. So, you know, talking about this massive change of pace that Tekken has had, I think on this note, and perhaps the neat twist of Tekken 7 is the conclusion, finally, of uh, the Kazuya and Heihachi feud. And these two characters are really... They've always been really good because they both straddle the realms of good and evil. 
and depending on your perspective and depending on the game uh, one or the other could be considered as the bad guy and Tekken 7 sees a, a really fresh take on Heihachi's ruthlessness and we sort of see him ultimately I think as a, as a tragic figure in many ways who's turned into a villain uh, due to these past events with Kazumi which I think um, I'm not going to delve into this too thoroughly because I've decided I'm going to start doing character analysis videos on each of the legacy Tekken characters so I'll talk about that more another time but I found it quite an interesting turn for this game's story and I think it revived some of the sincerity that had been lacking and that I really kind of subscribed to in this in this franchise in general. Now I've been talking recurringly about this lineage and uh, in terms of lineage I don't just mean the Mishimas but I mean of course the legacy characters and you, you know everyone has their favorite Tekken character um, and the longer you go back the, the you know the longer your character's been in the game I imagine. So on this note I think there's been some small controversies around the current roster of Tekken 7 and I was very surprised to see that characters such as Lei Wu Lung and Anna Williams have found themselves omitted in favour of some quite questionable new faces and it seems to be getting a bit dead or alive to that end in my opinion. And honestly I can understand the degree of backlash against this uh, and you know I understand it's important to introduce new characters but I don't think that should necessarily be done at the expense of legacy characters and obvious fan favourites, you know, um, you know, Anna Williams, for example, Armor King, for example, were introduced in 1994. You know, they've they've been with the game for a long time, and uh, Lei Wu Lung was introduced in the second game, and I think he's been there since as well in every, yeah, in every subsequent game. So they have clear appeal through both personality and fighting style, and I'm not sure what the deal is with this. I'm not sure why they opted to omit. Lei Wu Long, really, because um, it's not even like he has a similar fighting style to anyone else, and you know he's he's almost just a carbon copy because he's not. He's actually quite a unique personality and and um, character to utilize in this game. And again, you know, I can understand this backlash because, for my part, I mean, I've been quite lucky because Paul Phoenix has been my favorite character since I first played this game back in 1994, and I've been quite fortunate in that this guy has been featured in every game. And I would say that I associate him with the series as much as I would Kazuya and Jin. So in the instance that they ever chose to omit Paul Phoenix from a game, I would probably question whether to bother buying it or not, which sounds really petty. But uh, as I mentioned, you know, before um, and in my Tekken 1 and Tekken 2 reviews, I picked up Tekken for the first time and played as Paul. And I think it's the same for most people in that you know, you pick up a game, a fighting game for the first time, you play as a character, and that's like, that becomes your character sort of thing. So, anyway, um, on the note of Paul, and talking about how you don't really play as him because it's focused on the Mishimas in the story mode, this leads me on to my next crucial point about Tekken 7, which is the online mode. And this shows me, personally, how far my opinions have shifted pertaining to video games, and how my habits have changed quite considerably over the past few years because I remember mentioning in my Tekken 6 review that I don't play online so I never use that mode of that game and I would never entertain this you know aspect of a Tekken game but since the advent of the PlayStation 4 and the fact that you need to pay to have PlayStation Plus anyway I figured you know I might as well game online and you know I've been enjoying it with you know Battlefield 1 and Star Wars Battlefront and stuff but um Tekken 7 is the first time I've entered online gaming with with a fighting game and it's probably one of the most addictively awesome and simultaneously frustrating experiences I've ever had like in my life um and yeah so you know again I want to play as Paul Phoenix right and I think the best avenue to do that in in Tekken 7 is by playing online and Playing online in ranked games with Paul Phoenix has made me th realise three key things. Uh, the first is that I'm actually quite good with Paul Phoenix, and I never appreciated how much that was until you're kind of playing against other people. Um, but paradoxically, in the grand scheme of things, I'm actually quite shit at Tekken, because the calibre of people that you are capable of meeting online is just ridiculous. And the third thing is that people who repetitively bash combos with beginner characters are just the scum of the earth and nothing 
fills me with such hate and rage as encountering them. But anyway, um, as I've said, Tekken 7 Online is fantastic. And again, it's kind of enjoyable and it's aggravating and it's, you know, particularly for the casual to enthusiast gamer, which I'd say that I am. And, you know, I found now that I've ranked up into expert, I'm getting hard pushed for kind of consistent ongoing wins. And I've had to delve into Googling stuff like the whiff and the sway and the punish, all this kind of lingo that the hardcore Tekken fan base use and that they're aware of. And, you know, there's entire swaths of websites kind of dedicated to tactics with this. And, you know, I'm, I mean, I can't, I'm just an enthusiast, so I can't commit myself to this fully. But, um, but yeah, I do, I do find it really interesting. And on that note, actually, I'm friends with this Portuguese guy and he's, he goes to Tekken tournaments all over the world and he keeps trying to get me to go to Las Vegas with him because he's like really one of these pro, uh, semi-pro gamers sort of thing. But, um, but anyway, back to gaming from home, I find that unless you can muster this degree of zen-like acceptance that you're not the best ever, you're going to find that climbing the upper echelons of ranked battles will drive you to dis despair quite often. Uh, but don't worry, it's just a game. So anyway, um, the only issue I've had with this online-centric direction of Tekken and the limited scope of its story now is that one of the traditional incentives pl for playing through the game, which is being able to unlock secret characters, has finally bitten the dust and the unlockable feature has instead become the character battles in those short segments I was talking about earlier where you you know, complete one battle and get your ending video. Um, so I find that kind of a letdown because that has been one of the, the staples for the, repet uh, the, you know, the repetitive play value of Tekken has been being able to go through with each character and get these unlockable bosses and then, of course, go through with the unlockable bosses and complete the game with them, which Tekken 3 was probably the best at doing. You know, there was a lot of replay value to that game. But anyway, uh, and the only other point I have to make about this Tekken instalment as well is the music. And while I wouldn't necessarily say it's taken a downturn, downturn, there's certainly been a change of direction in the sense that character-specific themes, like we saw in the first three games, have been completely replaced by this kind of just arcade music, basically. It's designed to maintain the pace and the energy of battle rather than convey a sense of emotion or narrative for a given character. So, for example, we're not likely to see anything like King's Ring a Bell theme and see King's Church stage anymore because the storytelling dynamic of Tekken has developed so much um, and it's developed to the point, basically, where we don't need stages and music to reflect the characters and their story because, you know, we, we, have, we have the story. We, you know, we can get the, the story through these vignettes and, you know, various kind of means of exposition that are now capable with you know the playstation 4 so yeah so that about wraps up for tekken 7 you know i really like this game uh, as i said this review is comparatively short because i'm going to look at characters in individual videos but the only other thing i'd say is some people have meant uh, mentioned my change of name and things like that i am endeavoring this year from now to invest more time and effort into this channel so based on that you know if you like my content please share it or like it or subscribe to it um, drop me a comment on your thoughts because I basically always reply and I'm really up for kind of conversations about these games. So thanks a lot.